Hello, Renegade Marketers. For the last show of 2021, can you believe it? We're podcastifying a recording from our live show, Renegade Marketers Live, which is all about B2B marketing and features the CMOs from CMO Huddles, a community, an exclusive community, an amazing community that is sharing, caring, and daring each other to greatness. In this show, we brought on huddlers Jennifer Davis of Learfield and John Miller of Demand Base, as well as special guest Professor Kimberly Whitler of UVA's Darden School to talk about the three books that the three of them have written and had just recently been released, which just coincidentally happened to be around the time I released my book. So we talked about really kind of all four of the books. Now, while this show doesn't necessarily focus on one particular marketing topic, we are really zeroing in on decisions. How do you make better decisions? That's the topic of Jennifer Davis's book, but it also, when it came to John Miller, it was how do you make better ABM decisions? And with Kimberly Whitler, it was about better positioning decisions. So whether you're looking to make decisions for business or career or personal, this is a perfect show to ponder as you enter a new year, which will undoubtedly be filled with, yep, more decisions. So speaking of decisions, let's get on with the show. And hey, if for a change you really enjoy this episode, give me a shout, drew at renegade.com. Enjoy the show. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, here in my home studio in New York City. And I have a quick favor. My new book, Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands, came out a couple of weeks ago. It's a number one hot new release on Amazon, and the early reviews have been terrific, but I need 85 more reviews, and I need them really quickly. So if you'd like a review copy, drop me an email at drew at renegade.com or ping me on LinkedIn. Okay, with that, I need to tell you a story. So Ruben Klamer is not exactly a household name. Back in 1951, Klamer went to Milton Bradley with an idea for a craft game, which they rejected, but not unkindly, asking him instead to come up with a game to celebrate their 100th anniversary in 1960. Now, wandering the hallways of its Springfield, Massachusetts headquarters, Klamer came upon a game, the checkered game of life, which Milton Bradley himself, yeah, there was a guy named Milton Bradley, had invented 100 years earlier as a way of teaching the value of virtuous decisions. Remember that word, decision. Ironically, the game became popular among Union soldiers sitting around in between Civil War battles. Anyway, Klamer loved the name of the game, the concept of playing at life, and recognized the incredible marketing potential. Sure enough, the game became a huge hit among young baby boomers, including yours truly, selling over for 30 million copies in 18 different languages and is the second best selling board game of all time behind Monopoly. Now, I played this game a lot as a kid and luck plays a part, but you still had to make a decision. And the one I remember most important because these decisions would have implications. The decision I remember most favorably is the option of going to college. It cost a lot of money and it slowed you down, but it offered significant rewards later on. It, this was probably my first introduction to the idea of delayed gratification and one that I would actually embrace. So at this moment, you and my guests are saying to yourself, nice story, Drew, but what does this have to do with this show? And indeed, I'm getting there right now. Marketing, like life, is a series of decisions. The better your choices, the better the outcomes. So on today's show, we're going to be approaching the marketing game from the standpoint of decision-making and the implications of those decisions in both the short and long term. To help us do that, we have three marketers whose recent books will take us from the biggest decisions to positioning decisions to those on the account level. So with that, that's a long introduction, let's bring on Jennifer Davis, CMO of Learfield. Jennifer is a marketing veteran whose career stops include AWS, Honeywell, and Planar. She recently published this book called Well-Made Decisions, the inspiration for today's show. And with that, please welcome Jennifer Davis. Hello, Jennifer. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to see you. So here's a question. Did you play the game of life? I did. I did. I did find it 
a bit interesting. You mentioned that the game gives you some choices, but there are some things in that game where you don't have a choice. For instance, you would spin the wheel and you couldn't choose whether to get married or have kids. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. I came from a big family, so the idea of, of filling your little station wagon. <laughs> Oh God, yes, it's all coming back to me. It's hilarious. Well, um, I know they've updated the game, but we're not gonna talk about the game anymore. And I, I wanna get to your book because chapter one is bravely titled Making Hard Decisions Easy. And since I know a lot of folks agonize over big decisions, even losing sleep over them, and I'm in that book, how do you make hard decisions easy? Yeah, it, it's... Decisions are so impactful in our lives and really the premise of, of the book and the interviews and research and reflection that I did that went into, into its publication were really around this idea that decisions like genius, Thomas Edison famously said that genius was 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Well, I believe the same about decisions, making them have, making that discrete choice, decisions as events, are something that you should put good thought into and you should be uh, demonstrate good judgment and get input from others. But ultimately you make a choice and it's from that point forward that the work actually begins. Decisions are a starting line, not a finishing line. And so as I talk about decisions throughout the book and uh, as I've seen in my own career, there's the choice you make and and you hope it to be a right choice, but actually in truth, you make that decision right by all the activities that happen, happen after that. So it's provocatively named making hard decisions easy because the point of the book is you need to make decisions with the information you have as quickly as you reasonably can. And then you get on to the task of making that decision right. It, it's so funny as you're telling this, I, so I did a uh, a program last night where I interviewed a very successful entrepreneur who's still quite young. And he was telling a story of how he had decided to start an agency. And this was almost right out of grad school and he had no experience. And his parents, mm -hmm. he's first generation uh, uh, Indian American, and his parents were completely against it. But he had made the, he made the decision, and of course he made it work. And by the way, they were in the audience for this this particular event, and of course they are cheering his accomplishment. So I'm wondering on this part of outside influence and in career to, in making decisions versus sort of following your gut because it's your gut that's going to allow you to finish right to make it come true and sort of commit to it. And I just wonder how you manage in this process of decision making outside input. Yeah, I, it, that's a great example of that. And what you always need to do is, is seek out wise counsel. But sometimes um, you, you always have to send that through a filter because ultimately your mentors, your counselors, your boss, your parents, you know, your friends are not going to have to live with the consequences of that decision. And they're not going to actually have to do the work. Um, and so ultimately you have to kind of test your own conviction. I think you said your know, decisions are actually commitments. And I think that's a good way to look at it. Like what commitment are you you willing to make? Now, there are some decisions that are just, you know, on the face, bad ones, running into traffic, not that great of a decision. But most business decisions or career decisions are not that cut and dry. Good people with great experience can disagree and it's useful to get that input, but ultimately you have to live with it. And so you have to make the choice and and move on to the, the, the turn the page to the next chapter that begins. I just made this decision and here I go. So I want to bring this into the marketing department because you are sure. you're a CMO and I'm thinking mm -hmm. of critical decisions and knowing that you're not always in charge of these decisions. I mean, you want to be. Um, but you don't, you know, you have to persuade a bunch of people to come along with your decision. So I'm just curious how, let's say you're the CMO and you've decided, if you had that choice, that you want to take the brand in a certain direction. And that's, and you know, it's a really good decision, but your CEO says, mm, nah, it's a bad decision. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I know this isn't covered in the book, but I'm just sort of thinking about this. 
in life, we can make the decisions and we can make them real in business. Sometimes, particularly in the CMO, it's got to be harder, right? You got to bring everybody with you. Right. Absolutely. And I do talk about it a little bit in the book in terms of um, the importance of writing things down and framing them. You know, actually, as a marketer, you know that um, if you want to uh, influence a customer to make a behavior change, you don't start with the behavior change that you actually get have to get them thinking differently. And I actually feel like that's the key to influence even within your organization as you're trying to first decide and then maybe more importantly, implement successfully a decision that you've made. It really requires people to think differently. So the better that you can be at framing the decisions uh, to help the organization get to the place um, of making that decision. And you mentioned brands specifically. Uh, I just started with Learfield six months ago. And um, one of the things I did in the first 90 days is we rebranded the company. And that was very much um, an opportunity for me to get feedback and wise counsel and input from our various stakeholder groups and talk to customers and clients and partners and, and get a holistic perspective. But ultimately, I had to come forward with, with a recommendation and a plan to implement, which we're obviously in the, in the process of, of rolling out now. And, um, but I, it's a great example of one of those things. I couldn't have come in with, uh, I know the answer now, here it is. No, I had to lead people through a, a thinking process that not only informed my thoughts and ultimate recommendations, but allowed everybody to think about and frame the problem in a way that when I suggested the solution, it was, it was the right thing to do. I just happened to talk about that in chapter four. Welcome we in my book, but yeah, I'm with absolutely. you 100%. Okay, real quick, because I we want to move on. But you talked about, I thought this was fascinating, how Jeff Bezos sort of and his team looked at decisions between sort of door closing decisions and ones with hinges. Can you just talk about that idea real quick and explain the difference between those two types of decisions? Of course. And I'm so glad you, you pulled that out because I think this is one of the keys to making high velocity decisions that are high quality. You need to identify what kind of decision you're making. And in the Amazon nomenclature, there's one way door and two way door decisions. One way door decisions are ones that when you got to the other side of the decision, the door locked behind you. And if you didn't like what you saw, you couldn't easily get back to where you came. A two way door decision is more like, I don't know, the turnstiles of the shopping mall where you can come and go. And so, one-way door decisions might be, well, like spinning the wheel of life and getting a kid in your station wagon. That's a one-way door decision. Sure. You can't give the little person that. Um, but a two-way door decision might be, I don't know, what button color should be on our website yeah. or something like that. So things that you can easily change. And it's very important to identify whether you're making a one-way door or two-way door decision and put the right rigor around it. Often we apply one-way door decision making processes to things that are ultimately two-way door decisions and we can experiment. So the idea that I talk about in my book is if you want to reduce the risk and increase the learning of your decisions to get smarter as a business, you need to install hinges on your decisions. Mm -hmm. Things that might have been one-way door, high stakes, you know, high impact decisions. Think about how you can run an experiment, a pilot, a prototype, a test, a promotion, something that makes the decision easier, less impactful, and gives you confidence that when you roll it out at scale, you, you know, you'll be up for um, getting the results that you intend. Love it. Okay. Well, speaking of uh, hinges, we're going to move on. We're going to open a new door. We're going to welcome Kimberly Whitler, Assistant Professor of Business Administration at UVA Darden School of Business and star of episodes 155 and 156 of Renegade Marketers Unite. Hello, Professor Whitler. Hello. <laughs> and guess what I have right here? Oh, I don't know. What do you have? <laughs> I wow. have a book. I I heard that's an amazing, amazing book. They just need a few more reviews to kill it on Amazon. Is that true? I, I've heard the same thing. Unbelievable. Although all the early reviews are terrific. I know. How's that happen? Anyway, I have your book right here, Positioning for Advantage. Congratulations on that. We all know how hard it is to get those out the door. Um, let's jump in on this. Uh, 
let's talk about positioning. And, you know, you wrote a whole book on it. I spent a little bit of time in my book on it. You spent a whole book, which means it's really a critical decision on the road to building an effective program. Yet it feels like it's like a lost art. And so, you know, you and I both spent time in packaged goods. We understand that that's the way you do things in packaged goods, but most of the B2B world, not packaged goods. Are you seeing brands skipping this step or they just don't have the training to do it right? Or is it both? Yeah, you know, I, it's it's a really interesting question. And as I think about it, I actually think it's a little bit of both. So what prompted me and inspired me actually to go and look deeper into positioning was after I became an academic, I've worked for about 20 years, and then I became an academic. And I saw many of my students making the same mistake. And the mistake is they would have this great widget, they would have iterated it 200 times, and then when we started talking about basic things like who are you targeting? What's the size of the market? Why do you think that this is the best application for this product? Because I could almost look at it immediately and say, I don't think that there's a very big market here for this. And yet they had spent years working on something. What I realized is that they didn't understand kind of the process. They were steeped in product development without understanding where products should come from. So that was part of it, that, that they actually were putting product development before the positioning decision. And then the second thing that I've noticed with some marketers is that they're just still either young, they're less experienced, they don't have the, the skill yet. I was recently working with uh, a very, this was an individual in another country and he was a global manager on a, prod, on a product. And this was a very large global company. And he clearly had a positioning problem. And, and he wanted to address it. The issue was he just didn't have skill in trying to know how to assess the positioning, to develop new positioning options, to test those positions, and then how to, and Jennifer just talked about this, but then how do you sell that positioning decision internally? And so I actually think it's a little bit of both. It's it's that some folks don't know that this exists and others do, but are still, you know, younger in their development of building skill. And so I wrote it to address either issue. This, this book is really designed to help build skill, not just share stories or et cetera, but to help build knowledge and skill for those looking to do so. Yeah. I mean, that's what I found really helpful. It's like, you can't read this book and not know, have a bulletproof process for developing a positioning. I, you know, we, for me, it's easy to name brands, uh, B2C brands that are well positioned. I always, I'm, you know, Proctor has a ton. And I, one of my favorite examples of for a uh, gain detergent smell as proof of clean. And I, I'm going to bring that one up because what's interesting is, did the product manager say, oh, we're going to create a, a really sm good smelling? Or do we discover that after the fact that uh, that when people are cleaning their clothes after they're done, they pull them out of the dryer and they smell it? Because you were talking about, it sounds like you ideally you bake positioning into the product, in, in right? You bake it in, you give the idea that the brand can then uh, do it. Anyway, I'm lost in my underwear here, but give an example of a well-positioned B2B brand? Yeah, you know, there's actually, it's interesting because there are a number of brands that are hybrid that are both B2B and B2C. You could think of Amazon, Microsoft are two really good examples. But for a pure B2B play, you know, most folks think about tech brands. I'm going to go in a different direction and I'll give you an example of a professional services brand and that's McKinsey and Company. So I'm here on a, you know, on a top uh, MBA campus. And if you talk to any MBA student at a top campus, where do they want to go? The, and I don't say a, the elite consulting firm, uh, strategic consulting firm happens to be McKinsey. Um, what's interesting about McKinsey, by the way, is that they were founded almost a hundred years ago. They've been around for a long time, but when it comes to the biggest of problems, whether countries, governments, or businesses are trying to tackle them, oftentimes McKinsey's involved. So I would, I would say McKinsey's a good example. If you want one from tech, Intel would be an interesting one. Now I like Intel because even though they're a B2B firm, 
They also kind of had a pull strategy, you know, back in the 80s, 90s, where they sure. were educating consumers on the value of Intel inside. But again, Intel, surprisingly, is almost 50 years old. So it, you know, I, I was surprised when I was looking into this. Intel is an older brand in the tech space, if you will. Yeah, and Intel is such an interesting because it's sort of B to B to C um, or B to C to B, if you will. It's like we, we're going to create demand for our own brand, uh, and then therefore people, the the businesses will buy more of our chips. Uh, interesting. So, I as I look at McKinsey, and if we dove in on that, is there what is it? I mean being the most elite what makes that positioning so special can you have you looked at it and broken it down at all and found some elements that make it that have they've been able to keep that alive for a hundred years well it, when i think about superior positioning i kind of think about three different elements first it has to you have to have some sizable market okay and so let's just assume that there's a sizable market. But then when you're looking at superior positioning there, you want to own a space or territory that becomes ubiquitous with your brand. Right. So if we think about Walmart, it's low cost. If we think about Amazon, it tends to be, you know, uh, superior delivery that somehow there's something tangible, not always, but there's something tangible that you tend to own relative to other brands in the space. So that's that's one attribute. Um, the second attribute is, is that that territory is important and significant. And a lot of times brands forget this, that it has to be meaningful and relevant to consumers. So for example, right. um, let's pretend that I'm trying to position Sharpie pens and the Sharpie pen owns size, but size doesn't matter to consumers. Well, then that's, you know, then that's not necessarily a superior positioning. You want it to be unique, differentiated, but also to be important to consumers. And then lastly, you yourself have to be excellent at delivering on it. Yeah. So we've seen a number of cases where brands try to stand for something that they actually can't deliver on. If you go back and look at the, the last days of Kmart, the ads that they would present to consumers about their stores were different than the in-store experience that you would actually receive. So there was a disconnect between what they were trying to say and what they actually delivered. So superior positioning really kind of does all three of these things. And a McKinsey, you know, owns this kind of elite strategic consulting space. They, they tend to be perceived to do that better than other in other other firms and i'm talking about general strategy that obviously is important to the target and then they have an ability to do it right okay uh i had to laugh when you decided to go with sharpie because my first college paper english 101 or actually it was english one they said write on anything and i did an ode to sharpie just because it was in my hand uh I did okay on that paper. It was all downhill after that. All right, let's bring in, speaking of uh, folks that uh, have gone out on a limb in their careers, John Miller, CMO of Demandbase, is the founder, uh, co-founder of Engageo, which Demandbase acquired last year, and the co-founder of Marketo, and star of episode 84 of Renegade Marketers Unite. Hello, John, how are you? It's always fabulous talking to you, and it is amazing how far we've been, how long we've been talking. Oh my God! I mean, we met ten years ago, more than that, when you were at Marketo, and I wrote a piece about you on Fast Company uh, called "Drinking Your Own Champagne" or something like that. Um, but I would argue, in looking at your career over the last ten years, given that two of the companies that you started were acquired for large sums, you've made some good decisions. Um, so uh, <laughs> kudos to you. What has been the driving force of your career decisions thus far? <clears throat> well, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of luck involved. And I just that that is the truth. But what's driven me has been a passion for MarTech. You know, a, a, a vision of what, you know, how can we make marketing be more valuable and more respected by being more relevant? I mean, I hate the fact that sometimes, you know, people, I tell people I'm a marketer and I'm a little bit embarrassed because like, oh, you're the one who like sends the emails and the spams and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, I mean, 
when marketing is done well, right, we are actually helping to connect consumers with products that will make their lives better. The whole idea, you know, of a financial exchange is that utility is created. And if as marketers, we can facilitate that, we are actually doing good. But in order to make that happen, the marketing needs to be relevant to the consumer. And I've had a belief since the beginning of my career that that can be done with data and intelligence. So pretty much the theme from Epiphany to then founding Marketo to Engageo and now to Manbase has been how do we achieve that that holy grail of whether you call it one to one or just good marketing. Um, that's that's the thread that's that's driven me. Now, as uh, Kim Whitler, Professor Whitler, was talking and talking about. Uh, own something, it needs to be important and then deliver on that. Uh, are you, uh, were you taking notes? <laughs> Did it spark any thoughts in your mind as you were talking about that? That we were talking about positioning for, for your, uh, over your career and how some of these things have been so well positioned that they got acquired? Well, it's funny. I'm so like, yeah, positioning is relative. If I look at Marketo, you know, we started Marketo and we, we explicitly positioning against a company called Eloqua at the time. You know, Eloqua had been an early adopter in that category, and it was known as being expensive and hard to use. So Marketo literally were like, hey, we do the same stuff, but we're affordable and easy to use. You know, and that thus Marketo was born. It's a little and, bit harder these days. You know, there's a lot more MarTech and sales tech companies, more people eking out their own different right. positions. I'm thinking a lot about just intelligence, you know, as you know, if we can if we can own that, you know, that I think is very true to the vision. I, I just have to say the affordable, easy to use combo is killer. Uh, I just uh, in my book, I talk about Wasabi and how their their reason for being is they're 80% cheaper and six times faster than AWS. And they are a just a rocket ship with that value proposition and a great name. Okay. You've written eight of these ebooks and i actually read the most recent one of that the clear and complete guide to account based experience which was 261 pages including the appendix what compels you to write these treatises yeah well, yeah i mean first off you know i mean i, I hate calling it an ebook right i mean because you know you think an ebook's like 12 pages or something <laughs> you know and i really do write these things to be clear and complete um what what drives me is really, I think, two factors. You know, first is honestly, I just love teaching. You know, I, I come from a family of teachers. My mom was a teacher, my uncle's a professor, my sister's a teacher, you know, and, and so on. And I think, you know, I, for, if I may say, I have a gift for explaining things um, relatively simply. And so, and I, and, I, and I just really enjoy it, whether it's writing or presenting. You know, I mean, the books I've written have been you know, meant to help build my companies, you know, where I work. And there's, that's also based on a belief that in B2B specifically, you know, the way, a key way you build your brand is around thought leadership. Um, there's so much risk inherent in a B2B purchase. You know, you make a good purchase, your company's better off. You make a bad purchase, you can lose your job. Uh, you know, that, that, that the more we can build trust and reduce risk, as a B2B brand, the better. And I think people trust experts. So if I can establish my company and myself as an expert by helping to teach them something, I think that's how, that's how I'm trying to build my brand. And, and, my company. What, and what I, so here's the thing, it's a lot of times I'll have uh, CMOs will say, we can't do anything long because no one is gonna read it. And I emphasize the length, I won't call it an ebook. It's a book. I mean, it is a substantial piece of work that, as you said, is very easy to read and very, you follow it, but it's some sophisticated uh, concepts. What's your feeling on the length of, of these things? Does it matter? I mean, how do you actually get someone to open this up and, and read it? Well, I mean, I, we should ask that question to all your speakers, right? <laughs> and you wrote a book. How are you going to get somebody to open up your book? I think the fact that mine is delivered in a format that is easy, is designed to be easy to read online, you know, and is meant to be skippable and, and, and flippable to me, that's a bonus, not, not, not a detractor right. uh, compared to your traditional printed book of words. Okay. So 
let's just look at so that you talk about ABX and let's put ABX in the framework of decision making as this show is about. Walk us through a couple of the key decisions to get right when we're talking about account based experiences. Yeah, you know, I mean, if, if I can sort of connect that a little bit to my Marketo experience to kick things off. I mean, what Marketo helped to pioneer and that was so good was the idea of demand generation where you didn't send every lead over to sales as soon as you got it. Instead, you would hold it back and nurture it and score it and only pass it when they're ready. And that was great for the buyer because they didn't have to get unwanted sales calls. And it was good for the salesperson who didn't have to talk to buyers who didn't want to talk to them. So the decision is when do you pass that lead over to sales? When do you engage? Now you fast forward to ABM. You know, ABM was all about instead of waiting for the buyers to come respond to your campaigns, you reach out to them uh, in a targeted way. You know, and I, I used to use an analogy to explain that. You know, demand gen was like fishing with a net. You run your campaigns, you catch fish, you don't care which ones you catch, you just care if you catch enough. Whereas traditional ABM is like fishing with the spear. You know, I'm going to go after them. Fundamentally, though, the problem is it doesn't feel good to get poked by a spear. You know? <laughs> and what happened in traditional ABM is we were reaching out to accounts regardless of whether they were interested in hearing from us. We were failing in that decision <laughs> in terms of when should sales engage. And so ABX really is all, it's what it's meant to do is it's meant to take the precision and targeting of ABM combine it with the respect for the buyer experience that traditional demand gen had, you know, and make the decision to only engage with accounts at the right time. Okay. Only engage with accounts at the right time. So that way we're, we've, we're doing the same thing we did with ABM, which is said, these are the customers that we want to, uh, we want to engage with. But we're going to engage with them in a way that is sort of appropriate for the moment, given that individual. So we have where lots there, of data. Where, the, where they and that account is in its journey. I got it. Okay. And you do that by using account intelligence. Got it. All right. We're going to circle back to all of this, but we're going to take a little bit of break. I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, share some stuff about CMO huddles. So uh, give me a second to do that. Um, I'd like to plug CMO huddles because we launched it in 2020. It's an invitation-only subscription service that brings together an elite group of CMOs to share care and dare each other to greatness. One CMO described huddles as timely conversations with smart peers in a trusted environment, while another called it a cross between an expert workshop and a therapy session. If you're a B2B CMO that can share and care with the best of them, visit cmohuddles.com or send me an email to see if you qualify for a guest pass. So Jennifer, since you've been in huddles for a while, does that align with your experience? <laughs> yeah, I, I, lo I love that uh, share care and dare. You know, Learfield has offerings for B2C marketers. So it's really nice to connect to peers that are B2B uh, marketers and uh, from other industries to tackle topics and hear to hear perspectives. Very cool. Thank you for that. And I know, John, you're very new to CMO huddles, so I don't need to put you on the spot, but you have attended one. <laughs> So far, so good? Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, it was kind of cool. I mean, I know a lot of CMOs I've met over the years, so it was fun to get on the call and, like, see some folks I know, meet some new folks that, that I didn't know. Um, you know, the one I was on was all about brand, and, you know, that's near and dear to my heart these days, so it was good to hear other CMOs' opinions. Awesome. So here's the question that I'm sort of going to ask you all three. You've all been in marketing in various capacities. What's the best or worst marketing decision you have made in your career? Uh, and I'm going to randomly pick Jennifer to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, no pressure. Well, no pressure. I, we were just talking about the rebrand and we're still in the early days, but um, rebranding the company to Learfield um, after past mergers and and bringing that forefront the new identity system that we've brought forward actually is turning out to be a really good decision not only did it streamline the name and make us um, easier to to consume but it also um, is allowing us to tell a new story and for a company that's nearly 50 years old and uh, is a tech and media lead, leader in collegiate sports but with a long history uh, in, in different media types, it's just a, it's a wonderful opportunity to reintroduce the brand. So I would say that's the the uh, 
good, really recent decision that I made in my career. Okay. Um, Kim, how about a bad decision in marketing? That you <laughs> <laughs> and you well, could, but come on, you know, you're, you're not a practitioner anymore, so it's okay. You could have had a bump along the way. Was there a product that you went, mm, I probably could have positioned that differently? No, I'm, I'm going to actually kind of answer this in a, in a different way, which is, and it's actually related to a lot of my research. I would say I'm not a person who believes in having regrets. I don't believe in that. But if I had to look at a bad decision, perhaps some of my worst decisions were related to career decisions where I didn't completely vet a company before I accepted an offer. I didn't, you know, I wasn't adept at understanding um, sometimes how job specs might be misleading or um, incomplete. And, you know, I made that mistake once, but it prompted me, frankly, when I made the career switch to academia to study this, to try to deeply understand CMO roles how they vary and to try to help and prevent other CMOs from experiencing what I did. Yeah. So it's to be a good thing. And I, and I love that fact uh, that you and I, between the two of us have interviewed, well, I, you, I know you've already done it, but uh, several thousand by the time you add them up there, there's a, a lot of expertise there. Um, John, best or worst? Well, I'm going to stick with your original worst. Um, okay. And, you know, if I look at my time at Engageo, you know, we launched in 20, well, we started in 2015, launched in early 2016, and it was, it was almost magic. I mean, we, our first product, we had like product market fit to help measure account-based activities. It was like instant. It was amazing. And we hit our first million of ARR in just the first couple of months. VCs literally were throwing money at us. And then, you know, we had this big vision of what we wanted to do. And so we then immediately started working on our next product, which ended up being a sales prospecting tool to go compete with Outreach and Sales Loft. And, you know, all of a sudden we launched it. And all of a sudden now I'm finding a two front war. I'm like in marketing, you know, trying to sell to marketers and I'm trying to sell to sales and I'm still a little tiny startup. And honestly, we couldn't do it. We just couldn't do it. And all that amazing buzz and momentum that we had from just launching and hitting product market fit so fast fizzled because we were putting so much energy into this other product that was just not, even though I still think the strategy was good, we just weren't ever going to be able to get there. And so when you were assessing that and you look back on it, and because I talk a lot about this in the first chapter of my book, the focus, you know, it's, it's an obvious thing that focuses your friend, but it was it felt like a big opportunity, but the problem ultimately was because it was a target difference, your, you know, your ideal customer profile kept changing. The knowledge base that you needed to sell to was different and there were no synergies from the work that you'd done from past. Is that where it sort of, it there just. Was, there was not brand synergy. There was some product synergy. It was, right. really, it was honestly, it was hubris in some ways. Okay. He's like, we know where the market's going and we're going to lead you there. When we should have done is, hey, we've got people who like our first product. How do we double down there? Right. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, some wise sage said, "Business history is skewed with the carcasses of the overconfident," and so that <laughs> might that was a, a moment. Um, I actually that was a quote I did, and it ended up in a calendar somewhere. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we, we try to do therapeutic things. The good news is you recovered. And I'm really curious, how'd you recover? Well, it took a while to sort of figure out that that dog wasn't going to hunt. <laughs> and then kind of to go back and refocus on our roots. Um, you know, but honestly, a, a big part of it was then realizing that the fastest way to pursue our vision, you know, the, the dream of the next generation marketing platform was going to be by hooking up with demand base. And that the combination of these two companies would get us to my goals three years faster than if I kept trying to just beat on that, beat on that myself. Right. So that, that was really the unlock, to be honest. And, and I'm wondering, Jennifer, as you're hearing this and you're thinking about the decision making process and the thing that you do and you're going, what would John have done differently based on having if he had read your book? What would where would he have sort of come through and maybe avoided 
the sales product. Is there anything in the book that would help them there? Well, certainly if there, and again, I totally imagine that you took an iterative approach uh, to this, but I think it's a temptation in all businesses to try to be you know, more feature complete or have a more complete offering. I, again, the advice I'd give to John that I, that I, that I give to myself and, and many others is how do you break that down? How could, how could you know anything faster and with a smaller amount of investment? Or, or in your case, a smaller amount of distraction that would have told you, wow, okay, this is gonna be a lot. We, let, let's put that on ice until we get our core in order. So um, I, again, I, 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 I'm sure in the, in the software world, uh, he, he took an iterative and, and agile approach, but as I see more companies try to apply that same methodology to other things, it, hopefully it can keep us keep us on the on that right and focused path. As you, no, I mean, it, interestingly, arguably, you could say that hurt us rather than helped us, mm -hmm. right? Because all right, we have this new thing; it's not quite working, but gosh, if we just iterate to the next one, it'll get there. Oh no, okay, if we just iterate to the next one, we'll get there. You know, and 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 that's why it actually took longer than it should have to sort of realize it's not hunting, right? Because you kept trying to make the dog hunt. Well, well, we'll go over here. We're maybe we're, we need we're a different being iterative. Oh, if we're right. just a little closer. Yeah. But what Jennifer did say, which is important, is the amount of mind share and resource it was taking. So even though right. we were being iterative, it was still taking the bulk of the company when really we should have been doubling down on our original successful product. And Kimberly, I have to say, Kim, when we look at this, it could have been a positioning problem. It, it could have been, but when I was listening to this, this actually brings me back to a recent class I had where it was a startup, the case was a startup, and they had two very different um, targets that they could go after. And the natural inclination for the students is to say, I want everything, right? I want everything. I don't wanna make a strategic choice. And so I, I just wrote a note to myself to follow up with John, cause I'd love to interview him and write a story about what he learned. Sometimes I had a CEO at one point who said, Kim, it's the genius of Ant. And that was his way of never making a strategic choice. <laughs> it was like, I want everything. I don't really want to make a decision. Let's not make a decision. Let's not be focused. At another point in my life, I had somebody who was ruthlessly strategic that really understood that how you allocate your resources, if you spread them too thin that you're going to risk implementation quality and so he really forced people to make very difficult strategic choices and i tend to lean towards the latter rather than the 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 genius of and approach yeah i mean there's i think there, there's a place for and uh in a lot of situations uh but not when it comes to fundamental product offering uh, in, in changing, you know, something that would buy us particularly a small business when you get bifurcated like that, where you just get chopped down the middle and you might lose sight of the business that got you at least your first million. But anyway, uh, I, I, there's another tough decision out there and I want to make sure we have time to talk about this, which is, and it's so topical. And so I, I hope people stuck around for this because this is the moment of truth, which is companies and brands used to sit on the sidelines when it came to social issues. They preferred to stay a political, hey, we sell soda or we sell you know, software for, for companies to help them. Um, but now this decision has become more complicated as some might argue that silence is complicity. And since I know where you stand on this, Kim, I want to wait and just ask Jennifer and then we'll get to John on should brands take a stand? Has Learfield take a, taken a stand? And if so, on, on what and how did you rationalize it as a marketer? Sure, sure. I, I think it's a very timely topic, as you said. Um, Learfield, as I mentioned, plays in the collegiate sports live, live event space. So we have university partners, student athletes, fans, um, sports administrators, others that are taking stands and being very vocal with their point of view and are having a huge impact um, on, on the cultural conversations and, and a direct impact on policy and the like. And, and so they want to know as a partner what we stand for. And one of the things that, that we think about and, and I hope everybody's thinking about is that 
there's there's um, a, a lot of issues and a lot of causes and a lot of themes that one can focus on. And so it's very important to be authentic and to choose the things that are very durable and related very closely to what your company does. Um, and for us, um, we have chosen to invest around themes of diversity and equity and inclusion in all that we do. And um, we have some key strategic partnerships uh, in that space to actually develop talent uh, for the sports industry uh, from diverse backgrounds. Um, and we've also recently partnered with Team Impact uh, to connect uh, terminally ill children to college sports teams to make them part of the, their, uh, hopefully their healing process. And so we, using those as examples, we, we pick things that, are, that we think we can uniquely do. And we can, you know, because everybody, if, if every company, every individual kind of swept their front porch or thought about the things that they were uniquely positioned to do, I mean, that's how the world becomes a better place. So that's the approach that we've right. taken. Okay. Connected to the brand. So John, have you guys in any of the companies that you've worked at or found, uh, particularly ones that you founded, taken a stand on social issues and, and what, if so, like what? You know, I mean, not Marketo, which I'm sort of embarrassed about. You know, Marketo was sort of, I think, notoriously not long on those types of things. Um, and, and you know, not Engageo. It was, it was frankly too small. Um, I mean, nobody really cared what a 30-person company might say about a social issue. I am proud to say demand base is, I think, quite good at this. You know, and whether it was, you know, focusing on, you know, equity and hiring and diversity or you know, Black Lives Matter when that was, it still, it still matters, but like, you know, we were talking about it a lot, you know, a year ago, we did some really interesting things. Um, every every quarter at Demand Base, we're doing something uh, that is about us kind of taking a stand. We've also done really good stuff with kind of LGBTQ uh, initiatives. Um, so I, I think it's part of our culture at Demand Base and something I'm proud of. So Kim, let's talk about you know, you've written a lot about this and uh, about taking a stand and that there's some risk involved and there's evidence that it isn't always worth the reward. Talk a little bit about that that research that you've been doing or want to do or what's going on there. Well, I mean, the great thing about this is that there actually aren't always risks, right? There are a lot of efforts. There's a lot of activism efforts that generally we all agree with. I'll give you an example. PetSmart who is the largest pet adoption facilitator, I believe, in the country. They don't sell cats or dogs. They've, they've provided nearly $500 million for pet services. Just an enormous advocate for pet welfare. That's largely without risk. Who has a problem with saving little Louie's lives, right? <laughs> um, what, what becomes risky, I think, so first of all, activism, there's unifying activism and there's activism that divides us. And the activism that divides us tends to be when a mass brand like a Coke, um, which is historically apolitical, aligns with a political ideology. And what I think is happening, what happens, and I'll go back to the Coke Georgia voting reform law, where they started in a position in the middle, then they shifted to the left. And sorry, they started in the middle, the left wanted boycotts, so they shifted to the left, and then the right announced boycotts and they inadvertently reposition their brand. So what happens is they start off, Drew, let me pretend that you're liberal and you, which do you like, Coke or Pepsi? Uh, I worked on Pepsi, so I've always had a, an allegiance to that. Okay, so let's pretend that Pepsi, apolitical, comes out and you're liberal and they align with a, a conservative position like on the Georgia voting reform law. What happens is, is that you then ascribe all of the conservative views to the brand and you're actually repositioning the brand in the minds of consumers. And I don't think that's what CEOs are intending to do when they're making a paragraph position statement on a topic. But I do think what's happening is it's inadvertently repositioning them. What can happen then is it can potentially damage the brand image, the corporate reputation over time. What's interesting is if you look at Axios Harris, if you look at Nike, um, Coke, and Procter and Gamble. Procter and Gamble had the Gillette 
toxic masculinity brouhaha a couple years ago. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Okay. So P and G owns Gillette. Those three brands have all declined about 30 positions in terms of corporate reputation. Coke's declined almost 30. And guess what? Pepsi's gone up 30, Drew. So Pepsi's largely stayed out of this stuff. Coke's uh, brand purpose is to make a difference, which means that there's any, there's no limit to what they're going to potentially weigh in on. And so I think, you know, the risk is to understand what your core positioning is. And as you're engaging in these issues, to try to do it in a way that aligns with your purpose, that aligns with your positioning, you don't want to inadvertently reposition your, your business. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, you, you and I have talked about this and I, I think there's a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, ways of measuring this. I think ultimately it comes down to the company and the employees of the company and what they want to stand for and what they don't. And, and they take repercussions. I mean, in my book, I write about bank of the West who decided they weren't going to support companies that fracked and were involved in coal. And that cost them a billion and a half in assets that they had to de, you know, divest from, they picked up a billion and a half in California and Colorado. I mean, they, you know, it ended up being a good decision, but they made it because they felt it was like the right thing to do for the brand long term. So these things are really tricky because they took a big hit for that stand, but I think they ultimately had a position that they believed in and they could sell and it helped them with recruiting and it helped them with retention. So these are really complicated issues um, that we're gonna have to get into on another show at another date because uh, we've just scratched the surface. Um, final words here on, this has been, we've we've had quite a journey for on, on the world of decision-making. Jennifer, thank you for bringing that idea to the table here. Let's give one final words of wisdom for CMOs who are at this critical decision making and they've got a one decision they got to make. Um, I'll let uh, Jennifer go ahead. What Give them one bit of advice. Well, I, I would go back to thinking deeply about the kind of decision that you're gonna, that you're making. Is it a one way door or two way door? If it's a one way door, can you install a hinge and uh, think very, put as much emphasis on how you would go about making that decision right with great implementation as you put into making the choice. Okay. So make sure you know what kind of decision it is. Okay. All right. Um, John, uh, what's kind of got us some sort of random, help us make a tough decision kind of advice. Well, my advice, not necessarily related to decisions for CMOs, but you know, I think a lot of CMOs worry about pipeline a lot you know, and, and demand generation. I mean, it's very top of mind. And yet I don't think there's nearly enough discussion happening in the marketplace around the intersection between brand and demand. Um, and I think, you know, you can have companies with amazing brands and product market fit makes their demand look amazing. You can have companies with like less product market fit or not as good a brand. I don't care what you're doing. Your demand is going to be really challenging. You know, and I don't think there's enough conversation about those intersections. And I do encourage CMOs to sort of really be thinking about that and what it's meaning for their business. Okay. And Kim, last shot here in terms of one bit of advice for that, for the CMOs in the audience. Yeah. You know, I do um, some sessions, some exec ed sessions on strategic planning, and I have a way of kind of taking them left. And then I bring it back to a one key point which is figure out what the single biggest project is. Like really what it comes down to, what is the single biggest item that's going to get you closest to your goals? And then make sure you protect that with your very best resources and your time. What we tend to do is we, we, we think, again, everything's additive. If I do more, more disparate things, broader plate, then somehow that's gonna help me accomplish my goals. And, I think we lose focus of the big lever that's going to give us the biggest payoff. And so I, I tend to do this even with my personal goals. If I only could do one thing on my piece of paper that's going to get me closest, what's that one thing and make sure that I deliver that to the best of my ability. I love it. I love it. And if you go to uh, my book or send me an email, I will send you the clear away the clutter uh, pledge. Um, five things on it, one of which is if you add something to your to-do list, please take something off of it. Okay, thank you, Jennifer, Kim, and John. You're all great decision makers. 
Uh, rest in peace, Ruben Kramer, who died last month at the age of 99. He played the game of life very well. Thank you, audience, for staying with us. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.